Come, light of the world, come, morning star. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you. Guide us as you call us to journey with you in your service. Amen. Please be seated. Last week, we talked about the gospel as a call story, and indeed it was. And this week's gospel is also a call story, but it's also a fish story. How many of you have a fish story? Now, I I may have shared with some of you my fish story, but let me just reiterate it one more time. I used to live in coastal South Carolina. This was a number of years ago for a short period of time. A friend and I rented a small beach house on a place called Folly Beach. It's a tiny little island. Now, this was not a place where there were million dollar houses or condos. This was a place where the locals lived and they did their best to make a living. Some of them fished, they tried to feed their families. Why was I there? Well, I was having one of those times in my life where I didn't know which way to go. It was a time of discernment. And maybe you've had times like that as well, where you take a pause in your life to figure out the what next. That place where you know where you've been, but you're just not sure where you're going. And maybe you continue on the same path, or maybe you take a different one. Have any of you been in that place in your life before? I see a few nods out there, perhaps more than once. So when you're between things in life, when you're trying to determine the what next, you might also be between jobs, as was the case with me. And I had some savings, but I was continually looking for ways to keep my expenses down. One day I was traveling over a small bridge, a place where part of the river ebbed and flowed with the sea tides, and I noticed this group of locals under the bridge, and I was curious about what they were doing, so I pulled my car to the side of the road, I got out, I walked over so I could see better. And the people under the bridge were spread out along the bank, and they were standing knee deep in the water, and they were casting these hand nets. You ever seen these hand nets that people cast for fish? Um, they're you, you kind of put them up in the air like this, you throw them out in the water, you pull them back in. Anyway, I had been eating peanut butter sandwiches, but I couldn't believe the bounty of what was in those nets, shrimp and frit, fish and crab, food that I could only dream at that point of putting on my table because I couldn't afford it at the grocery store. I thought, hmm. The next day I went down to the Kmart store and I bought myself one of those hand nets. Now, in this part of the story, I do need to disclose something. I have fishing genes in my family. (laughs) My grandfather, Antonio, was a deep sea fisherman on the island of Sicily. And he and other fishermen went out to the sea early in the morning in these small boats, and they cast these hand nets and drew them back in, just like the folks in South Carolina did. And also, I have been fishing since I was eight years old, baiting the hook, taking the fish off the hook. So given that history, how hard could it be? How hard could it be to fish with a hand net? So here's what happened. The next morning I got up early and I took my net and I went to the bridge and I was pleased that I was the only one there. Early bird gets the fish, right? And I stepped into the water and I twirled my neck above my head like a lasso, just like I had seen the folks that I had watched up there in the air. It went and it came down right over my head and shoulders. (laughs) I had netted myself indeed, but not to be deterred, a second attempt had a similar result. I netted tree branches. Now the third time the net hit the water, it sank as it should. I slowly pulled the net It felt full until it caught on the rocks and the pilings. And when I finally got the net to surface, it was ripped to shreds and there were no shrimp or crabs or fish in the net. And I took what was left of that net and quite dejected went home. And I continued to eat my peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. 
Now, for me, it was not easy, not, I mean, it was easy, very easy to leave my net. I could leave my nets. It wasn't my livelihood. But in today's gospel, that's not the case for Simon and Andrew and James and John. They are fishermen. It's what they do. Their nets are their lives, the only lives that they have ever known. They know the sea, and they know the tides, and they know how to throw a hand net. They know fish. They have the patience that fishing requires. They fish together, not alone. And they're bound to each other by their nets. And their survival depends on it. And then comes Jesus, who asks them to come along, to leave everything they know, everything that is routine and normal, everything that's important and predictable, their livelihood, their family, and follow Jesus. Come and follow me, says Jesus. Writer David Luce says that there's something compelling enough about Jesus and his message that prompted these four, and then later many others, to follow him, to become his disciples, to become students of this teacher and students of his mission. So what do you think that might be that caused them to follow Jesus? What could be so compelling, so compelling that it was enough to draw you away from all that you knew? And yet, Jesus knew his mission, and he knew what he was fishing for. And especially, Jesus knew that even he couldn't do his mission alone. I think Jesus understood that the world-changing work, the work that Jesus was called to do in his birth and in his life and in his death and in his resurrection, required community. It's not something that could be done alone. If you look at the Gospels, Jesus is rarely alone, except for when he goes off to pray. But more often, he is with his community, which ever, ever grows. So it's Christ's grounding in community that fills those nets, that gathers people together in his name and in the, in the spirit of love. So I think this, this gospel gives us all pause to wonder now, what is it that Jesus is calling us away from in this new year and what Jesus is calling us to? And how would our, our worlds change, each of us, if we just left our nets behind, or at least one or two of them anyway, and step towards new possibilities. Our, our bishop in his weekly message says this about the call, the call of Peter and the call of the brothers. He says, Jesus didn't call people to be brilliant. He didn't call people to be original. He didn't call people to be stars. But he did call people to give our lives fully over to Jesus, that everything we do points directly to God, who is fully revealed in Jesus. And it turns out it's often our very limitations and deficiencies, the very ways in which we do not dazzle that mark us most recognizably as companions of Jesus. We don't have to be spectacular. We have to be who we are and also committed to Jesus. So in this coming year, as we all discern what's next for each of us, for St. Paul's, for our beloved community, let's continue to journey with Jesus, allow ourselves to leave some nets behind. Find some new ones, or to use Christ as the net to gather people together. I think we can all practice living kindly in our thoughts and actions, just as Jesus did, and to let the possibility of being called to challenge a status quo move within you. Try to engage in gathering people's hearts and ask yourself, what congregational life in Jesus means. 
and remember those lessons from the fish story. We're not likely to know success the first time we throw that net in the water or the second or the third, but to keep casting the net, even as you swim into the net and depend on the beloved community to show you how to fish. Let's continue to journey with Jesus and which with each other. This sermon is quite a fish story, isn't it? Amen.